So um, the film that we watched um, was directed by Qasem Abed. Unfortunately, we invited him to join us here for um, this discussion, but he was not able to join us from London. Um, but I am really delighted to have um, two of our um, invited speakers for the Iraq Front and Center Symposium join me. Um, both of them are uh, uh, storytellers in their own right, and so we'll be having um, a discussion that sort of reflects on um, the film um, and also uh, discussing your work as, as, um, as storytellers. So I'm going to be just giving a brief introduction for, of both Leila and Sinan, and then um, I'll be asking you some questions. So I'm Wena Demluji. I'm faculty in film and media studies here at UC Santa Barbara and um, one of the organizers of, of the symposium. So Leila Fadl is a national correspondent for NPR covering race and diversity. And Leila has covered the Iraq war and occupation for nearly five years, or had, um, with Knight Rider, McClatchy newspapers, and later the Washington Post. Her work in Iraq won the prestigious George Polk Award for foreign reporting. Her work provided a comprehensive array of disturbing first-hand accounts of violence and conflict by juxtaposing the agonizing plight of families in ethnically torn neighborhoods with the braggadocio of a vengeful insurgent proud of his murderous exploits and the carnage and sorrow of, among victims of Iraq's most deadly car bombing in a remote region of the country where few reporters ventured. The award committee um, of the George Polk Award wrote about her work. They continue that her reports also offered vivid depictions of complex developments and subtle shifts in Iraq's ever-changing military and political struggle. Um, after working in Iraq from 2012 to 2016, she was in NPR's international correspondent based in Cairo, Egypt. Um, and from 2011 to 2012, she was the Cairo bureau chief for the Washington Post, where she reported on the wave of revolts in the aftermath of Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, and beyond. Um, Leila was a 2016 Edward R. Murrow Press Fellow on the Council for Foreign Relations and um, earned several prestigious awards for her work, including the 2016 Gracie Award from the Alliance for Women in Media and the 2013 Lowell Thomas Award for the, from the Overseas Press Club and, of course, the, the George Polk Award. She now covers race and diversity in America for NPR, and many of you have probably heard her voice on All Things Considered and other um, NPR programs. So um, I really I thank you for joining us here thank today. You. Thank you, Layla. Thank you for inviting me. And we're also um, joined by Sinan Antoun, who is a poet, novelist, translator, and scholar. Um, he was born and raised in Baghdad, where he um, and left the United States after the 1991 Gulf War. Uh, and in 2003, he returned to co-produce and co-direct a documentary film about Iraq under occupation, entitled "About Baghdad." Sinan is an associate professor at NYU's Gallatin School and co-founder and co-editor of Jadaliya. Uh, he has published two collections of poetry in Arabic and four novels, which have been translated into English, French, Turkish and Spanish and other languages. The Corpse Washer, which I know um, some of you may have read, it's assigned in classes here um, at UCSB, was long listed for the Ind Independent International Fiction Prize in 2014 and won the Best Amer Arab American Book Award in 2014 and the 2014 um, Saif Gobash Banipal Prize for liter Literary Translation. The novel has been described as a powerful and important novel of the Iraq War and a necessary counterpoint to American stories focused almost exclusively on the suffering and trauma of Iraq's occupiers. Sinan Antoun's The Corpse Washer offers a moving liter literary elegy not only for the number numberless Iraqi dead, but also for those who remain to bury them. It must be read, and I agree. The English translation of his fourth novel um, is forthcoming from Yale University Press in 2019. Please help me welcome Sinan Thank you. Thank you. So in um, Life After the Fall, um, you know, the, the, the film begins with a story of um, Qasem who's returning after being outside of the country for um, 35 years um, to Iraq in the aftermath of the 2003 US-led invasion and the subsequent um, fall of the Ba'ath Party. Um, and you know, he was one among a number of filmmakers and journalists um, and, and many others who, like yourselves, who returned um, or went for the first time to Iraq to witness 
what was happening in the country and to make sense of it and to communicate it to the rest of the world. So um, in various facets of your work, you have done that work of communicating it um, uh, through literature and through film and through um, your reporting. Um, and so I, I'd be grateful if you could share a bit about um, that particular moment and going to Iraq at that time um, for, for yourselves and um, sort of what your aims were in returning or going to Iraq for the first time. Go ahead. I'll start? Oh, okay. Ladies first. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually first went not right after um, the fall, but in 2005. Um, and at that point, I, as a journalist, felt that I wanted to make sure I was documenting what it, it, what it was to live and survive invasion, occupation, and what um, American policy meant for people neighborhood to neighborhood across the country. And so, uh, as a journalist, I didn't, you know, most of us didn't live in the green zone because that meant being walled off from the country that you were meant to cover. And so what we did was a lot of what you saw in this film. Um, I told the story through the grave diggers in the cemetery where they buried um, the youngest brother. I told the stories through pregnant women trying to have their babies without getting shot on roads that were either after curfew where you could be shot by an American soldier or by whatever militia may be controlling your, your neighborhood at that time as the country sort of divided. I told the story through marriages and divorces, divorces that were often prescribed by by tensions rather than a lack of love or a marriage falling apart, but by logistics where you couldn't get to a neighborhood that was safe for both of you or your in-laws could no longer visit. There was one family that I remember talking to who would meet at a neutral point because she was Shia, her husband was Sunni, it was no longer safe for him to live in the neighborhood where her in-laws lived and where they had lived, so they left. And then every time she would go visit her family, they would meet at a central point, she would be picked up by her brothers, and then they would go and see their family. And so that was sort of the way that I tried to tell the stories, was through what was happening to families, um, one way of one. And the beautiful thing about this film is that they did that through the continuity of one family. And so you could see sort of the, the direction that the country was going, what was happening to this one family. And so that was sort of my goal as a journalist, going there. Yeah, so... Um my, um, my best friend and colleague, Bassam Haddad, and I, ironically, had always wanted to make a comedy about Arab Americans. But 9-11 and the war on terror and the, and the run-up to the Iraq invasion changed so many things, but changed our priorities as well. And frankly, in the run-up to the war, the, the history of the US involvement in Iraq and the history of Iraq, but most importantly, Iraqis themselves, were represented in US media in such a superficial and reductive way that we felt um, that we wanted to go and do something. Sadly, it's a very simple task, but someone has to do it, is just to go to Iraq and interview as many Iraqis as possible to show that Iraqis, like other human beings on the planet, uh, are a spectrum who come from different classes, different backgrounds, and they all don't have one of two opinions, they're either Saddam lovers or US lovers, that right. is more complicated. And so just a few months after the occupation, we went in July and we were lucky in that it was before the collapse of security that you see in this film. So that was the brief moment of the first few months where you could actually drive around the city without being stopped by checkpoints or by suicide bombings. And we had very limited uh, funding because we were independent. Uh, and because to, to salute the courage of our colleagues back then, not, not many people were willing to go to Iraq for, for no money. So we, we interviewed just as many Iraqis as possible across the city. And um, until today, and this is what's great about this film, is there are very few documents, visual documents, where Iraqis speak about their feelings and their desires for more than 30 seconds in American media. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be like that, but this is so rare that you actually see Iraqis who are not terrorists or extremists, just civilians who are, and who are paying the price of the US occupation and its aftermath. 
So for me, uh, but I must say that um, for all returnees, because it is a genre of Iraqi artists and writers going back from the diaspora, is that even though I had tried very hard to keep up and stay abreast of everything and not have any expectations, but for anyone who had left the country for 10 or more years, it is just, uh, was still shocking what the sanctions had done to Iraqis, to Iraqi spaces, to the material reality of the city, to people themselves, I mean. So I don't know if it's, if it's legible for you, but to see how everything is decrepit in a way, the cars, the space, and Baghdad wasn't like that in a way. So that's something that's perhaps, you know, very difficult to, to imagine what, what kind of Baghdad existed that has completely disappeared. And that reality, which is now so normalized, Whatever one may think, and one should think of life under dictatorship, but there was an open city that was not divided, and there was something called security and safety, and that's what, what these people in the film and Iraqis today uh, long for. Thank you. Well, um, you both sort of talked about what your, your aims were um, in going and telling stories. So I'm curious how in doing the work and in making the films and doing your reporting, um, like how did that land in, in uh, you know, media landscapes that are saturated, as you said, with much more reductive portrayals of Iraqis? Like, do you feel like that work had traction or, uh, you know, can you just contextualize it a bit in the fields that you were, you were working with? And, um, mm. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> To be honest, I mean, I think that the coming back, a, a lot of the times, the Iraq war is spoken about as, as something that happened to, to this country or something about freedom here or, you know, these big sort of slogans about what Iraq was to America and not as much about what happened to the country and the people that live in it or the idea of ISIS or Al-Qaeda or the Ba'ath Party or the, the Shias or the Sunnis and all these catchphrases. I remember the first time I came back to the States after having left Iraq, I moved to Egypt. And I was somewhere in DC and somebody turned to me and said, oh, are you a Sunni or a Shia? And I was like, what? This is like normal conversation in DC. So it sort of became this versus the stories that you want people to remember about life and what life looks like. Because in the time that I lived in Iraq, we had um, an Iraqi journalist that worked with us who um, was working with us but was also a physician who was shot by an American sniper because he didn't stop in time at a checkpoint. And ultimately nobody, they gave a, f a little bit of money to his wife but his daughter lost their father. Iraq lost a doctor and a journalist and a person that was telling the stories of that country. Um, there were kidnappings. We had a, a former pilot who worked also with our bureau who was terrified that he would be assassinated because there was an assassination campaign of pilots. And all of this was just happening and you couldn't really control it. And then you had to sort of side with whatever group controlled your neighborhood to protect yourself, but you don't really agree with the group that was in charge. And now today, all of the people that I worked with in Iraq have either left, which is a huge brain drain on the country. These were people who were professionals and creators or doctors and they're here in Sweden, one still trying to leave, or are no longer alive. And so um, I, do think, uh, it, I do think that a lot of that story gets lost. And I still tried to do that. You know, I did go back to Iraq during the, the fall of Mosul to ISIS, and then ISIS liberated. But it was this cyclical thing that people don't see as um, people, are, again, are searching for this sort of stability, which ends up having you in all these different people's hands. And in Iraq, the thing that I always looked at were the walls, because they told these stories of who had come through and taken power of the neighborhood. And every time a new person was in, in power in that neighborhood, um, there was like an, a new paint job and new slogans on that wall. So yeah, I don't know if I answered the question or I started rambling, but. <laughs> For our documentary, we, we didn't want to have a simplistic, linear narrative. We intentionally wanted more a fragmentary narrative because that reflects the situation. So in showing the film in this country, we, we succeeded in showing it in a lot of universities and community centers. 
But of course, even PBS uh, Outpost of Hope refused to, to show our documentary because they said it didn't have a story. Which I think it says something about how, of course, if it's not the narrative that you're used to, then it's illegible and it's, it's not a story. But I, I have to say something which is that, unfortunately, not just for Iraq, but for many places in the global south, it's very, very difficult and challenging to imagine that people there live full lives for a variety of reasons, and hence their death or the destruction of their lives is not really registered as a loss, mm. in a way. Their lives are, to, to quote Judith Butler, is not grievable, because the lives, the different lives that, that they live are, many of us cannot approximate or imagine those lives as lives that are equal. And you know, you can see there are so many examples of that. With the terrorist attacks against, in Paris, it's an attack against civilization and against culture and against all of us, and everyone has a French flag, but an attack in Lahore or Baghdad is just an attack, and there are just numbers of people who don't have names and who don't have faces. And let's all be honest, or most of us, so in this film, of course, because the girls are not veiled and because the men are drinking alcohol, let's be honest, that makes them more human to many of us. I mean, I would think, I was thinking to myself, had all the girls been veiled, I think the level of humanity would have decreased a little bit. So that's something else that that we always have to think of and, and, and think about. Yeah. Sorry if I hijacked your question. No. And you went in a <laughs> completely different direction. I put things up I'm there. a hijacker. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you bring up a point about, um, you know, always talking about like humanizing people through film or through storytelling. And, um, you know, that can, that whole phrasing, we can, we can sort of unpack that. But in the context of this film, you know, there's a very particular perspective, which is that of the family and family life and the home um, and uh, family relationships. And I'm wondering, like, in this style, which is very, you know, it's like a very Tay, almost like a home video aesthetic, right? So we feel like we get to know these characters and we're with them in, you know, mundane moments of life. So I'm wondering, you know, either in reflecting in the film or thinking about the work that, that you all have done, like, what work does that do to place uh, an audience in an intimate family space? Uh, Sinan, in your novels, family is a big uh, part of the context of, of your characters. And I know that you, you, as you said, you reported on births and, um, you know, thinking about family relationships and, and how that told a story of, ever, of everyday life. So. Anything that you guys would like to add? Um, well, I feel, so. what I loved about this film is that the family is not one thing. You know, mm. they are complicated. They, you know, they have this one younger religious brother who met a friend and he turned, he, he changed his sect and he became more religious, but still sits at the table when they, when they drink and joke at night. Um, and they joke about his faith, you know. What I love about that is that it isn't, oh, there is the extremist part of the family and the secular part of the family. They're a family. And they've all taken different directions with their lives, including the, f the family member who came back and left for a very long time. Um, and I also think, you know, the, the idea of, of what it is to worry about your child on the way to school, all of these very nuanced things that happen everywhere, um, I think are really important. And in this context, it's it's the evolution that happens over years with these characters. It's not a character you meet in 2004 and or 2005 and 2006, but what happens to them, where they go, where they divide. And I think, you know, that's, um, like for example, the morgue scene. That was a morgue that I often went to and I saw those scenes and I heard those scenes, but placing them in, in, a, in a position where you know the man who then they see on the seventh photo on the day, this particular day, um, I mean, that's the type of storytelling that complicates the idea that, like you said, there is some type of opinion. You know, sometimes when you're a journalist abroad, they'll say things like, what, what are people saying on the Arab street, which doesn't exist, and nobody has one opinion, and I don't know where that street is, but that really is something people think. Like, go get the Iraqi opinion. It doesn't exist. Like, that's a crazy idea, which is, I mean, what you talked about with your film. Yes, and before the war, I mean, the opinion was shaped largely by columns in the New York Times where Thomas Friedman said, my Iraqi friend says. Mm -hmm. And of course, if one of them thinks one way, 
then the other 28 million think the same way. So we go back to why we made our film and why this film, again, that task is simple, but to show that, lo and behold, within the same family, they don't all agree on everything, generationally and otherwise, with the elections, for example. And I think, sadly, it's also for practical reasons, in a way, a lot of these films are about family because one can only have this type of intimate access to one's family that they trust the filmmaker because if there was mistrust during dictatorship years afterwards there's even more mistrust and fear so but to me what what is also important is to frankly to show also how they begin to internalize the discourse of the war on terror so this notion that there are these the terrorists are the on the other side and then the election and all of that in the state but it's it's tragic because then we see how, you know, it was all da dashed all of their hopes completely, nothing. Even those who were hopeful, not, I mean, I was never for the invasion and occupation, I never thought that it would work, but the sad thing for when we made that film elsewhere is you see a lot of people who gave the United States the benefit of the doubt and said, let's give them a chance and, but ultimately, I, the other thing that one has to face is that Iraqis were never really the subject of this project and this discourse. And you see that in every way, whether in the way their safety was never really a primary concern. They were never really the subject of this whole project. And the whole construction of the Green Zone says something about that. So the Green Zone is the only place where there was semi-normal life and security, and outside, it's, it's hell, really. Or, as I, I said before, he, earlier in the day, in the first few days of the, of the war, an embedded journalist from CNN was with, a, with an American uh, group of soldiers, and as they exited the camp, he said, the soldier told the journalist, this is Indian territory, meaning this is barbarism, this is where everything goes. And let's remember that many of the books that were written in the first seven or eight years about, the, about Iraq and circulated in the mainstream of the United States were written by people who went courtesy of the United States Army and talked to people in the green zone. So you got the green zone notion of how things were okay. There were these glitches here and there. You didn't get this perspective of the people who were living in real Iraq, which okay, is outside the to, green zone. I have to interrupt, sorry. Please. <laughs> But I have to actually disagree. I said many. <laughs> I didn't say all. I'm only going to say this because, um, you know, if you read the pages of the Washington Post, Anthony Shadid was documenting the day. Of course, and that's the, the exception. Out, the exception. There's Anthony Shadid, how many other ones? There's, only, there's him. Oh, I was, there were many, McClatchy and Knight Ritter, we were living outside, but there also has to be a consumption. It wasn't the, necessarily the TV. There were articles that were coming out, and I'm not saying it was the no, majority. No, of course, of course, but, the, the, but for the first five, six years, yeah. I mean, the questioning of the entire project didn't really start in earnest until five years after, until the catastrophe could no longer be covered, which is a disaster, I think. And the other thing about that, the whole idea of the green zone, is as a journalist, what really shocked me or disturbed me is that people were prescribing policy from inside walls mm -hmm. and they didn't know what was happening outside. And so they would say, oh, we went to this market the other day with the, with the soldiers and it was safe and everybody was telling us how great it was. Well, we would go to those markets the next day alone. And that's when you saw what was going on or the number of times that they've dealt with violence in that area. And so the idea that there was prescription of policy from people who literally had no ability to actually see what life was like in places that they were prescribing policy. And that included the politicians that had come back mostly from, from somewhere else. And so that was really something that not only Iraqis felt, but, felt, but it was also quite disturbing to think of, to, to prescribe policy in that way. Of course. And then Anthony Shadid was one of the well, a few, few minority of journalists who spoke Arabic mm -hmm. and didn't depend on a fixer or on a translator. And that makes a great difference in how you interact with the interviewee, who then, when, when they see that you're speaking that language, they open up in a different way. Right. And that was the great thing about, um, about working. There were lots of families that would sort of take you in and, and let you see their lives. But five or you know, six, seven, eight years in, 
people were exhausted. They didn't want to tell their stories anymore. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to talk about what had happened and where things were going because it didn't change anything. And then the other difficulty was the desensitization in general of the stories, where you had to constantly come up with new and creative ways to make people care about what was happening because it was easy to just be like, oh, those people over there. And that's not just for Iraq, but for you know now when you look at Syria, when you look at Yemen, when you look at all kinds of things that are going on around the world where people will say, oh, you know, those people over there. And that was, I think, your, as a journalist, the biggest thing that I always wanted to do was make sure you couldn't say those people over there, that you could relate in the way that you know, teens, these, the, my favorite scene with the girls and the note on their door where they're like, we're not voting, we need to sleep, Dad. And then him, you know, I just think those are the moments that are so incredibly important to, um, to make sure people understand that everybody's complicated. See, Nana, so you, um, you've, you've written fiction set in mm -hmm. Iraq during this time. Can you talk a little bit about how those uh, experiences returning or, you know, just being in Baghdad in this new, um, this new city, which was unrecognizable in many ways, how, how did that shape uh, your approach to, to writing fiction? Um, I mean, I guess one the urgency to me was to 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 write about this new reality, but the other uh, thing is how to resist the amnesia about what the city was like before, but without you know representing it in a nostalgic way that belittles the violence of dictatorship and of Saddam Hussein. I think that's the challenge for anyone is that, because let's go back to the problematic of the Manichaean discourse is that, you know, if, if you are against Saddam Hussein, then you must be for the US occupation. Something similar is happening now with Syria. So how do you narrate the history or the stories of the place and of people in the place uh, and maintain that complexity. And so I try consciously or unconsciously to always have different generations and always have, you know, the, the, the discourse and the counter discourse because it's also the reality that there are divisions inside Iraq and in the Iraqi diaspora, especially generational but other divisions where there are people who who are living, as one of my characters say, there are people who are living in the past, and, and sometimes they have the privilege of living in the past in a way. Someone who is retired and who spends their time mostly inside the house uh, is not like someone who has to go out every day, especially if they are a woman. The, the city has completely changed. You don't navigate this, the space the same way uh, you used to 20 years before. So that's what I try to um, or that's what I feel the urgency to, to tell, the different counterpoints. And also the, you know, it's a cliche, but the marginalized voices in a way. So the problem is that because Shiite parties dominated the political scene in Iraq and because of the nexus of power of media uh, in the region dominated by Saudi Arabia and the the confrontation between Saudi Arabia and Iran, there was a demonization of Shiites, frankly. So in a way, that was why the corpse washer is centered around a Shia family, because as we see in this film, is that the Shiites also are not all in the militias. They are also the, the victims of, of, of this violence. And that's, that's the other thing about working there is that there were moments where people, you know, there was, so I have a friend who now lives in DC, but I'm now Thomas Friedman, my Iraqi friend. <laughs> um, but as long as you have more than one friend, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, she was really my closest friend in Iraq. And the reason I did a story on pregnant women actually was because we had gone, she had just had her, sec her first daughter. And she had to really think about, like, how am I going to have this baby? How am I going to schedule? She ended up scheduling the cesarean so she wouldn't be on the road. But there was a moment that ultimately um, she is living in this neighborhood that has now become divided on sectarian lines. She's from a diplomatic family, and her and her brother work with us. They're getting threats at the door because they know 
that they're doing something, but they're not sure exactly what their job might be. So the bullet, the bullet in the letter, that is something that happened to her. Um, and she had to make a decision to be okay with the group that controls her neighborhood because they will protect her from whatever group controls the next neighborhood. So there are these like sort of uncomfortable choices that are forced on people to protect their families in places. Um, and so you sort of are at the mercy of whoever might have guns in your neighborhood. And that was really, that was a situation that ultimately led to them leaving. But there's also that, where you kind of get caught up like this man who's killed over something that has nothing to do with him. So, so um, the director of the film, um, Kasim, was uh, also, in addition to going and returning and making his own film, he, one of the reasons he actually mm -hmm. went back was to set film up a school. film school um, in Baghdad, and um, one that was free of charge and would allow Iraqis to tell their own stories and sort of be able to um, learn the skills to, to make their own films. And that was, you know, he was, um, it was him and Mason Pachichi who went back together, both uh, filmmakers based in Britain. And, um, you know, they were successful for a number of years and, and had, um, I think, around 70 students who actually, you know, trained with them at the school. Um, but there was, uh, just in trying to make the films themselves as um, Baghdadis who live, you know, in the city and have to face the everyday realities of, of living and moving around the city and trying to film, um, there were all kinds of obstacles um, and sometimes life or death obstacles that, that arose. And so um, one of the filmmakers, the student of, of Qasim's, um, Imad Ali, um, was making a film about uh, Al Munatabi Al Street, which is, you know, um, famous as being sort of the literary uh, heart of, of, of Baghdad, of the capital, um, and was um, uh, focusing on this one cafe, the Shabandar Cafe, which was destroyed um, in an explosion. And when the filmmaker returned to the cafe to film, he was actually shot in his leg and in his chest, and he survived. But in telling his story, he actually, uh, the film itself became about um, this <laughs> the impossibility of even telling the story of his city. Um, and so it sort of ends with this very um, um, uh, difficult epilogue about his own you know, fate mm -hmm. and, and sort of he's lying on a table um, you know, with his injuries, unable to go and pick up the camera and, and shoot his own film. And I tell this story because I think it's just one example of, um, you know, in thinking through why don't we hear, why don't we, um, you know, why isn't there more access to stories from Iraqis who are, who are inside Iraq? Um, and, uh, and I think that, you know, I'm constantly reflecting on that question. Why is it, um, you know, people who come from outside, whether it's the diaspora going in um, to, tell the, to tell the story and, and, um, and so I, I just sort of invite you to also think about that and what, what you know of um, the Iraqis you worked with and sort of, uh, you know, how, what is that tension between, you know, our privilege to tell stories on behalf of people who live through these things um, versus those who are, who are writing from within the country. Um, when in shooting the country, uh, shooting the country, in shooting <laughs> the documentary, this lady, told us, the film crew, I will forgive the US for bombing us, but I will not forgive them for the sanctions. And sorry to go back to the sanctions, but what the sanctions did from 1990 to 2013 is really destroy so much of the social fabric and the capabilities of Iraqi society. So that speaking of filmmaking, they weren't even allowed to import film reels so the first film that was made after the invasion by Odeh Rashid mm -hmm. called Under Exposure is made in film reel that he found which is so old. So this is what happened and the, the, the sanctions also forced two to three million Iraqis, mostly of the middle class, to leave. 70% of Iraqi artists and others ended up being in the diaspora. Add to all of that, and I remember in the year preceding the invasion, a number of Iraqi groups were collecting the names and contact info for diaspora Iraqis who were willing to go back to Iraq in the summer and work in the country. And many of us signed up to do that really. I was willing to go and try to teach there in summer. Others were willing to do 
people were willing to invest money, but the occupation authority was responsible for maintaining the safety and security. And it did not do that. And that really foreclosed so many things. We were talking earlier about research. So if three months after the, uh, the occupation, it became really dangerous to go in Iraq and do anything because you could not, there was no guarantee that you would not be killed driving around the city. So that already changes everything also for anyone wanting to go there, but for Iraqis. So for me and many other people who grew up in Baghdad, Baghdad was, of course, it was a dictatorship, it was a police state, but it was an open city. You could walk from one end to the other. And I'm not belittling living under dictatorship, but the Baghdad of later times after the invasion was a completely compartmentalized, divided city. Yeah. And there was also the, the ethnic cleansing because of the civil war. So really it does not exist anymore as an open city. And hence I saw the documentary that they made about film school, which is heartbreaking because there are these young, talented kids who just want to learn how to make a film, but just the simple things that are taken for granted in most cities around the world are not available to them. I mean, one person told me, you know, I, the thing is, if you go to buy groceries, you might be, you might be killed. And, you know, one image stayed with me because I always think of the psychological impact of people growing up in this city. So it was an image of a man taking his five-year-old daughter to school and they're crossing the street and just 15 meters away there is a corpse. So this is the reality that people have been living with for such a... So how can these people even begin, I mean so many of them are narrating, but the structure there is not really available and there was no reconstruction whatsoever. I think the, the Institute of Cinema and Theater is still not rebuilt until today, which was a very, I mean, it was a very advanced um, film production infrastructure and theater in Iraq. I don't know if I can say anything more than that. <laughs> well, um, Sorry, I, so, um, I will not answer the next question. No, that was to, really good. To, <laughs> I'm just going to let that stand. Um, thank you again. Thank you, thank you.